Hello, hello, and welcome everybody to another episode of the Polynesian Eyes podcast. We welcome you from wherever you're listening in from around the world or whether you're viewing us on YouTube. Today, we're going to go through a video that covers a very important topic uh, in Christianity and in the LDS world uh, position as well, and that is the nature of the Trinity and also in contrast to the perspective of the LDS Church on the Godhead, which is basically our perspective on the God, the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. And this is a topic that even within Christianity, um, it's difficult to get a clear understanding on the position of mainstream Christianity on the Trinity. And we're just going to walk through, uh, the video we're going to watch is a video by Ruslan. He is a Christian influencer uh, found all over social media. I enjoy a lot of his content. And this video I came across and I thought, you know what, this is an important uh, topic for a discussion on, uh, especially in relation to the perspective and the position of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ as restored through the prophet Joseph Smith um, in regards to the nature of God. And the nature of God, as, as both mainstream Christianity and the LDS uh, church would agree, that this is life eternal to know the one true God. Our ability to understand the nature of God whether it be through the Trinitarian or the Godhead perspective from the LDS Church, has a direct impact on our ability to develop a relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Ghost to obtain eternal life. And our ability to be saved, quote-unquote, slash obtain eternal life, is in many ways directly related to our ability to understand the nature of these three supreme beings. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through Ruslan here, and he's going to, he's, he's identified a, a good video that he believes best explains the Trinity. Uh, and then we'll kind of give some feedback on that. And then he also provides a few verses that we'll respond to and kind of take a, a, an LDS perspective on the Godhead. And then we'll go from there. So with no further delay, we will jump right into it. The Trinity is one of the most controversial and often debated doctrines in all of Christendom. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes straw man by opponents who don't fully grasp it and sometimes misrepresented by evangelicals that don't really know how to articulate much about their faith, let alone something as intricate and important as the Godhead. But I stumbled across this video from a couple of years ago. I wanted to share with you. The moment that these two words come together to me is kind of like, hey, there's some serious work and effort that needs to be done. When you say that something is so intricate, yet so important, what, what we're really saying is there's confusion, right? There is confusion on something that is extremely important to understand, including the nature of God. And what he's expressing, you know, kind of leading up to it is, is a testament to that confusion that ultimately the inability to properly understand and express the being in which one worships is a problem. And that is a, a should really be an, a, a flag for someone to say, I need to spend some serious time and energy to understand this position, this doctrine, because why? This is something that is foundational to my ability to achieve whatever promises or blessings um, that are promised to me because blessings and promises are made by a being and your inability to understand that being means your ability to have faith and to have hope in that being's ability to come through on those promises can be jeopardized. And, and when I say that, I'm not saying that not having a full understanding of the nature of God right now is, you know, unacceptable. What I'm saying is it should be a primary focus and target of every person, whether they're Christian or not Christian, is to properly define the beings that they worship. And that is a significant part of a spiritual journey. With you guys, specifically on the doctrine of the Trinity, I got three verses that solidify the idea of Jesus being co-eternal God, God from eternity past. Almighty God, Yahweh himself, okay? So 
Let's jump into this conversation. This is a pretty cool video from Nabil. In a rational way, the concept of the Trinity. No, that's a very good question um, because it is uh, so idiosyncratic to the Christian faith and it is extremely important to understand. When I first wrestled with the Trinity, I found it to be very difficult. In fact, I was taught that the Trinity was veiled polytheism, uh, being raised in a Muslim home. Uh, that's that's a, often a straw man from folks that are not from the Christian tradition and, want to sh and, and don't understand the Trinity. They will say, oh, the Trinity sounds like polytheism, multiple gods. There's three gods. That's not the Trinity. Especially with verses from the Quran. And I do want to say that the the reason it seems to me that the reason why the Trinity doctrine comes about is the inability to distinguish the difference between the Father and the Son. And that's really and then and and, and then the Holy Ghost gets lumped in there in order to solidify that position because yes, we are monotheistic in the sense of we believe there is only one supreme God, and that is God the Father. But we recognize him as a God, but the challenge comes about through the Christian perspective and other, you know, monotheistic religions like Islam and uh, the Jewish um, doctrine, the Judeo doctrine is, well, if God the Father is a God, clearly we saw the Son, and he's a god so in order to accept both you would have to accept that there are multiple gods yet we only believe in one god and therefore this trinity doctrine seems to kind of come out to help reconcile that challenge right because we believe in one god but we're saying there's two different people that popped up both proclaiming to be god how do we reconcile that on like Surah al maidah verse 73 uh it made it pretty clear to me that the trinity is a belief in three three gods not one and when you, i asked the average christian to explain what the trinity was i usually didn't get anything more than a blank stare and they would say well it's three and one and i'd say well what does that mean you know it's three and one it's like well that's a shampoo not god tell me what what is <laughs> what, what do you mean three and one and generally speaking i wouldn't get a response i'm going to cut to it so that we can have more questions it's important to be able to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity if you believe in it. Uh, if you believe in it, be able to articulate it. Otherwise, you don't really know what you believe in, and you don't actually believe it. You want to believe it, but you yep. don't know what it is. That's good. So be able to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity. And, and basically what Nabil is saying is, I don't think he's he's saying that because you don't understand what you believe, that that's not acceptable. Obviously, we all have to start somewhere. It's acceptable. What Nabil seems to be advocating here is the significance of truly understanding and being able to express what you believe because why it is life eternal to know god and so it is critical for us to understand god and the nature of god in order to obtain eternal life also important to that is our ability to help others understand the nature of god if we cannot express it well Maybe we have a testimony of the Holy Ghost within our heart, and that is extremely powerful. But another way to help others understand is to explain it in a manner that allows them to begin the journey of faith, to begin the softening of the heart and allowing the Holy Ghost to use our words more effectively. Obviously, the Holy Ghost can do all things even without our words, but we are co-workers with others and the Holy Ghost to help bring about the work of God here on earth. And so our, our ability to clearly and succinctly express our beliefs is critical in our ability to help others understand and come to a knowledge of God. Trinity is the belief that God is one in being and three in person. One in being and three in person. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, it's not a contradiction. Because if I were to say it's one in being and three in being, that is a contradiction. That's right. It's one in being and three in person. Not three gods. So what's the difference between a being and a person? A being is that quality or that essence or that substance, whatever you want to call it. A being is that which makes you what you are. Mm -hmm. And a person is that quality or that essence that makes you whom you are. That's good. Being is what you are, and then there's who you are. A being is that which makes you what you are. A person is that which makes you... Yeah, I... I 
what you are to me seems to be intricately tied to who you are, right? Um, that that seems to, though you can make somewhat of a distinction, but they are intricately tied, right? Who you are as a person is almost inseparable from what you are, a human being. You remove the human being, it dramatically changes who you are. That that seems to be something that that is a little difficult for me because they're so intertwined. To whom you are now? What kind of a being am I? Thanks for the vote of confidence. I appreciate, <laughs> appreciate that. Human being. I'm a human being. Now, who am I? I am Nabil Qureshi. So, what I am is a human being. That's my being. Who I am is Nabil. That's my person. The two are not the same thing. That's right. All of us. And, you know, and that that that's where I'm coming with a little bit of difficulty because we do not have mashed beings on the earth, meaning a being by its nature is separate from another being. That, that, that's where I'm having a little bit of difficulty. I understand the distinction, I guess, a little bit of who you are because there are individual beings are separate and each one has a different character, a different perspective that makes them who they are because of the experiences they have on in life. But still, they, they, they still seem to have the feeling of separate and not necessarily conjoined beings. In here, shame, share essentially the same type of being that we are. We are human beings, but none of you share essentially the same kind of person that I am. Mm -hmm. We're all different persons. Okay. I, I think, okay. The, 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 the position he's kind of expressing here is the equivalent of what the LDS would say being as in we would put the term purpose, right? We can all have one purpose to accomplish like a team to win the, win the game, but that purpose does not mash us into one person. We're still separate individuals or persons, but we are unified or one in our purpose. And I guess he's in our perspective, he would be using the term being. And I guess I I don't have the, the I'm just not grasping how you can say being as being one, right? And yet three persons, because by nature a being is in an individual. So the characteristic of a being is very different from that of a person. God is so I, I am one. Well, and, and once again, the characteristic of a being is very different from the person. I would say your the type of being you are has a significant impact of the type of person you are. A horse, a different type of being, cannot behave as a person with human being as its what? Those are two separate beings that are not the same. And even if they were the same, they're still individual beings but could be who are also individual persons because of their different experiences. Being with one person. God is one being with three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Is there anything like that on this earth? No. But does that mean God? And that's where, this is why the Trinitarian position is so foggy, right? And, and it's because why there's nothing on earth that we can correlate with to explain this position. Does that mean it's false just because of that? No. There are many things that, that are difficult to explain, but we can find parallels here on earth. And, and that's especially something so fundamental. Uh, it's, it's kind of a challenge to kind of come up with a, an understanding and ability to clearly express it because it is something that is so unfamiliar to us. God cannot be one being in three persons? Absolutely. It means he can, he can be that if that's what he is. There's no way we can know these deeper things about God apart from revelation. Uh, I and I agree 100% with that statement right there, that revelation is critical. However, there's a little bit of a contradicting, contradiction in my perspective on what he said just before that, that God can do whatever he wants because he's almighty. Well, if God can do whatever he wants, then he can make three separate beings who are three separate persons to be the Godhead. 
if he can do whatever he wants. If we really believe that doctrine, then just as one could say, yes, it's quote unquote possible that he is, you know, one being manifested in three persons, which we have no evidence that that's even possible. But the fact that he is God and he can do all things, then one could take the position because because he can do all things that he can also run and do whatever he pleases with three separate beings who are also three separate persons to use the terminology he has. So even within there, I could say, okay, no, if I, I agree with you, Nabil and Ruslan, but if God can do all things, then why do we say he cannot be three separate beings and three separate persons at the same time? Because he is God and he can do things as he wishes. Why are we putting God in a box that he can only express himself through the Trinitarian position? I do think that there is enough evidence in this world for us to conclude that God exists. Yep. I think it is the most rational conclusion. It's the most, uh, it covers the most data. It makes the most sense. It fulfills, I think, the criterion of Occam's razor. I think it works. Uh, but how much can we know about God after that point? I think revelation is necessary to know the deeper things about God, and this is one of them. 100% agree. Revelation is critical. And, and maybe that's one of the reasons why mainstream Christianity is, is wrestling so deeply with the Trinitarian position is because though they say revelation is necessary, but they seem to be hesitant to accept more revelation from God or that God can provide more scriptures and more knowledge. Just as they limit him through the Trinitarian doctrine, one could also say that mainstream Christianity limits God in the ways and the means by which he can reveal himself to us. That God is three in one. Uh, it tied in with this concept then of Trinity is also the idea of the persons of God. What does it mean for Jesus to be the son of God? What does it mean for, uh, for God the Father to be the Father? These are different roles in the Trinity, and oftentimes people see the term son and then impute inferiority to the son. In a sense, that's accurate to do. So let me put together some Bible verses for you, because especially when I debate Muslims or dialogue with them, these issues come to the fore, as they did with me when I was a Muslim. Some people will say that Jesus says things like in the Gospel of John, he says, the Father is greater than I. That's true. He How is it that. possible that Jesus is God when he says, the Father is greater than I? Mm -hmm. And I would answer that question by saying, in, in our organization, Uncle Ravi Zacharias, he is the CEO of the organization. He is greater than I am. I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. He's at the top. Right now, I'm earning brownie points. He is greater than I am, but he is a human just as I am. So his being is essentially equal to mine. He's a human being. I'm a human being. We're equal in that sense, but his role is greater than mine, and I'm inferior in that sense. So when Jesus says the Father is greater than I, the being is equal, the role is different. The being is equal, and the role is different. Now, some people can get into, is that a hierarchy? Is that complementarianism? Is that subordination? It would depend on what you mean by those roles being different, right? But they are different. And this is how the trend. One could also take the position that he's defining them as three separate beings and three separate persons. The position that's being expressed here can also be the same logic that you could use and position that you would take to say that they're three separate beings. Just like he said, there's the CEO and there's him. Well, those are two separate beings, two separate persons. Granted, he says, well, it's because it's God and God is, you know, can do it how he likes. And like I mentioned earlier, if God can do it however he likes, why can't he do it in the means of three beings and three persons? Also, what he seems to be describing is... If their beings are human beings in his example, why can't we say that gods are a classification of a being? We are human beings. CEO is a human being. Frontline uh, manager, human being, different roles. Seems to me you could take the same approach for whatever classification of being you want for God the Father and for Jesus and say that classification of exalted being but with different roles, right? So, I mean, I, I don't see how this necessarily, I mean, at the end of the day, I think there's just so much similarities between the LDS perspective on the Godhead and the Trinitarian position that it's just that one little nuance, doctrinally 
the way it's explained, the way it's expressed in many ways is, is almost exactly the same. But the fogginess on mainstream Christianity's position is because of this awkward concept of God being one being, but manifests himself in three different people. Very, very difficult to to really come up with a, I don't want to say rational, but a very clear and simple way to express the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. Trinity all comes into focus when we start reading the scripture. One last thing I want to close with is some people will say to me, but Nabil, the Trinity is not present in the Old Testament. This is something new that Christians came up with. Nope. I don't think so. Nope. I think when you start reading the Old Testament a bit more carefully, now through the lens of clarity that we have from the New Testament, you start seeing it in the Old Testament. And people might say, where? Where did we start seeing the Trinity in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. I see it in the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, let's take that back into the Hebrew. It says, Elohim created. Elohim is the plural of God. That's it's right. God's. In the beginning, God's. But then the word created treats that word as if it's singular. In the beginning, God's created as if it were singular. So right there at the very beginning of the Old Testament, you have plurality and singularity in the Godhead. You see it again in the very same chapter where it says, we God refers to himself as we, plurally. How can God refer to himself plurally? And some people say, well, you know, the Queen of England does that. The plural of majesty was not used in Hebrew at that time. It was not convention. And then also when God says, we will create man in our image, male and female, we will make man. Male and female, in his image, and then it goes to plurality hmm. once again. Multiple times, plurality in the Godhead. I'll end by saying this. In the Shema, this is the, this is the statement that Jews would often recite twice a day. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. A very profound proclamation. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. In a world of polytheism, it's very profound. But that word one, Echad, is not used to describe a singularity. It's used to describe something like a cluster of grapes. You would refer to the entire cluster as one cluster. That's what the word Echad is. So even in the Shema, we have shades of the Trinity. Mm. It's just clarified through the person of Jesus, and it explains so much of what happens in the gospel. And I think uh, there's a lot more we could discuss here, but I think it's one of the most beautiful teachings about the depth of God's character and how he is unlike the universe. Amen. Amen. And, and the reason you could take almost everything that he expressed there and says, yes, that applies to the LDS position on the Godhead in expressing it, right? The plurality is because there are three separate beings who make up the Godhead, like a presidency. But clearly there's only one God, one supreme God, which is God the Father. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, another interesting thing is he says, you know, through the lens of the New Testament, we can now look back into the Old Testament. To me, I agree. And what we're saying is through the Book of Mormon, through the Pearl of Great Price, through the Doctrine and Covenants, through restored prophets and apostles, we can take those scriptures and that additional revelation and magnify even further. And then, you know, to really understand the nature of God. Another interesting thing that Nabil said is, you know, how we can understand the character of God. Well, basically, by saying it's, it's, it's not anything we can relate to on earth, that therefore God is unknowable, and the fact that, you know, by saying, hey, by revelation, we can see these things, well, by limiting God's ability to, or the ways by which God could give you revelation, you've limited him in his ability to give you that. Very challenging, very difficult position to take. Um, and then he comes back to another concept that is really important, which is once again, why we have the series on the creation, a proper understanding of the creation has a direct impact on the ability to understand the Godhead or the Trinitarian position here. And so that's something that I think is really important. Um, I, I will say, you know, as we go in here, this is not something that would be unheard of in, in the Book of Mormon either, right? Some people may could read the Book of Mormon and and come up with this same concept of God and Jesus God the Father and Jesus are the same person expressed differently 
and we'll cover that. Like if the, if somebody, a Christian, were to read certain parts of the Book of Mormon, they would come to the, oh, yeah, hey, look, the Book of Mormon is saying the same thing in the Trinitarian perspective. And that's pretty evident when we look at Abinadi. And so we're going to jump into some verses here in the Book of Mormon that kind of give that, you know, at the surface level, a similar concept to the Trinity in the Book of Mormon. And we'll look at Mosiah 7. And this is the explanation as to why Abinadi was killed. And in verse 27, it says, And because he, Abinadi, said unto them, this is King Noah and the evil priests, that Christ was the God, the Father of all things, and said that he would take upon him the image of man, and it should be the image after which man was created in the beginning, or in other words, he said that man was created after the image of God and that God should come down among the children of men and take upon him flesh and blood and go forth upon the face of the earth. So Abinadi comes and says, Jesus is the son and the father. He is the father of all things. And so that seems to kind of give the general idea that's similar to the Trinitarian position. This is also, we'll go kind of go straight into what Abinadi actually says here. So this is Mosiah 15, and we'll read the first few verses here. And now Abinadi said unto them, I would that ye should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in the flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. And having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being father and the son, once again, expressing what would appear on the surface to be a Trinitarian position. The father, because he was conceived by the power of God, and the son, because of the flesh, thus becoming the father and the son. And they are one God, yea, the very eternal father of heaven and of earth. And thus the flesh becoming subject to the spirit or the son to the father being one God, right? We're we're seeing here a lot of similarities there. Suffereth temptation and yieldeth not to the temptation, but suffereth himself to be mocked and scourged and cast out and disowned by his people. So what, what we're really running into here is there seems to be a need to understand the nuances and how, you know, it says here, Jesus is the father of all things, right? And this comes back to the creation. And really, we need to understand something here that's really important. So in Moses 1, this is Joseph Smith's translation of the Old Testament. And this would be Genesis 1, verse 1. And what we're going to, and it says, It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, I reveal unto you concerning this heaven and this earth. Write the words which I speak. I am the beginning and the end, the Almighty God. By my only begotten I created these things. Yea, in the beginning I created the heaven and the earth upon which thou standest. So, this is where the nuances really matter here. God the Father, the Almighty God, says that in the, in the beginning he was the, the the driving force behind everything yet he says here by his only begotten he created all things so though god the father is the almighty god he delegated or basically authorized his only begotten jesus christ to be the creator of all things So now we see why Jesus can also be the Father, because why? He created all these. In a sense, because they come through him, he is the Father, right? And he created all things spiritually first. Then we look back at what Abinadi said. This is why he's the Father, because God the Father worked through him authorized him to create all things. And though he created, that's why he's the father, because he created all these things, but he's still below God the Father. He is the, God the Father's the CEO. Jesus is the COO. He's in charge of operations. He executes all things, right? And he builds everything. 
And so because he is the builder of everything, the creator of all things, he's the father. But when he took on the flesh, he becomes the son. And that's where Abinadi is making the, the, the parallel comparison of father, son, the father to the son, as in the spirit to the flesh. Spirit being father, flesh being son. And that is the proper order of things. The spirit is superior to the body. And that's the way it should be. The body should be subjugated to the spirit, just like a son is subject to a father. That type of understanding, once you look at the creation, then we start to see, okay, there are some nuances here. There is God, the father, the eternal father. He is the, the, the energy source that drives all things, including everything that the savior does. And yet the Savior could also be the Father because he is also the creator of all things. And because he came in the flesh, he is the Son, the only begotten. We also see this a little bit more in another area in Moses, verse 26, Moses 2. And I, God, said unto mine only begotten, which was with me from the beginning, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And it was so. And I, God, said, let them have dominion over fishes of the sea and over fowl of the air and over cattle and over all the earth and over everything creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So once again, the Trinitarian doctrine separates God the Father and Jesus because Jesus appears in the flesh. And that, that it's that manifestation in the flesh that shows this projection of uh, of one being but he's projected in the flesh according to Moses 2 the separation existed in the spirit realm before the physical earth was brought into full swing and so this separation of quote unquote beings existed before we even came to earth and it's not just through the manifestation of Jesus in the flesh that God projects himself in a different personage. No, Jesus was with God in the beginning, meaning they were two separate beings from the very beginning. And I think that's something that's really critical to understand. And this is why understanding the creation is very, very important. And just one other note, and we dive deeper into this and in, as we progress through the, the creation account series that we have, and that is, in Moses 1, Elohim, as Nabil shared earlier, is the term that's always used. And then in Moses 2, it's Elohim Yehovah. There is the transition there. And it's directly related to this concept that we discussed of God, the Father, who authorizes Jesus to be the creator, who also is the Father because he's the creator of all things spiritual. And, and that's where that transition happens there. And we'll dive into those nuances. But really what that's saying is, is there is a reference to Elohim as driven by God the Father. But as we go into Genesis 2, it's like the torch is, is handed off to Jehovah, who is Jesus, to, to lead the way and to carry through the, the remainder of the creation. And that's a distinction that we make that Christianity doesn't quite have um, because Jehovah in Christianity and in uh, Judeo uh, theory and, and religion is that Jehovah is the God Almighty in the sense of God the Father, the supreme being. So we'll come back here to uh, our good friend, Ruslan. The Trinity is important. Is It gives us a, a good understanding of so many other aspects he mentioned specifically in an organization you have someone that's at the top of the organization a founder of the organization and you have someone that is uh, an employee of the organization when you have a good grasp of the trinity you have a, a a great grasp of how authority works how people be see once again this is where it gets foggy right because even in his example he's saying someone is the ceo and someone is the employee those some ones are different some ones. They're not the same some one. This, this is why the Trinitarian position gets foggy, in my opinion. 
being equal in essence, but different in role work. You extend that out to marriage. When you have a, a healthy understanding of the Trinity, you understand that male and female, husband and wife in a marriage, they're both of the essence of the marriage, yet they have different. Once again, every example, the essence would be the goal, the purpose, the target, but husband and wife are two separate beings, are two separate persons. Every example, just it seems that as we have this discussion, it becomes very clear why the Trinitarian doctrine is so difficult to, to grasp because th there's nothing really in my perspective to grasp at. Because every example you use to describe it and to express it falls back to separate individuals tied together in a common goal. But regardless of the, 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 the expression you give, they're separate beings. And, and they're not one being mashed together, expressed in three different ways. Different roles. That not, the one is not inferior or superior, but they do have different roles, and that may look different sometimes. We're talking about the family dynamic, right? Church structure, right? So once you have a good grasp of the doctrine of the Trinity, it, it has so many implications for authority. It has so many implications for different roles, yet there being equality. It has so many uh, implications for community. And lately what we, we, mm -hmm. we've been seeing is people who are, are struggling with this idea of Jesus not being co-eternal, right? We've seen some of this kind of come up repeatedly. Jesus is, uh, uh, Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is entitled to the name of Yahweh, uh, as much as the father is entitled to the name of Yahweh, which is true. If you read Hebrews one, you will see Jesus being referred to as Yahweh from a son. See, and this is where it gets very, very foggy in, in an inability to correctly understand the titles and the designations of God, the father and Jesus, because Jesus is Jehovah. Jehovah is the word a separate being from the father that is where a lot of this confusion comes from right and 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 that's that's where we think the ability to properly assign titles roles and beings correctly is so critical to understanding the nature of god you can't understand the character of god when he's expressed in a way that is virtually impossible to understand from 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 what I'm kind of hearing and understanding here, because there's nothing we can grasp towards. Um, where it refers to God as Yahweh and is referring to Jesus with the same Psalm in Hebrews chapter one as Yahweh. Yahweh is different than the word Elohim, which is plural. Yahweh is the almighty God. And, and that's what we're kind of referring to here, right? It's referencing Jesus and Yahweh in the same verse because it's the same person. And, and that's where I see a lot of this confusion is coming from is just a, 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 a inability to correctly assign titles and names to. And the nuances in God the Father authorizing Jesus to be the creator and therefore being the Father, though there is a God the Father above the Savior Jesus, who is the firstborn of the Father. Uh, and when you look at uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus can't have a beginning in terms of God giving him a beginning from eternity past. No, Jesus is the beginning. Okay, so this is different. So check this out. If you just look at, at John 1. That's, and that's an interesting perspective there, right? If Jesus is the beginning, then how is it that he only manifested himself and was expressed as a flesh on earth? Right. And and we would agree with his saying that Jesus is eternal. We believe that Jesus in man is was eternal. And that's through revelation because God reveals that. And that's something that's, you know, once again, it, there, there, there seems to be a challenge in navigating, at least from the LDS perspective, the differences of the roles, the titles, and the level of involvement of God the Father in Jesus. And once again, the Holy Ghost just seems to be wrapped in towards the end because there's an effort to try and navigate the nuances of God the Father, the eternal Father, the one true God, and Jesus, who can in many ways be expressed in titles very similar to God the Father, but is not God the Father from the LDS position. One, one. In the beginning, the Word already existed. 
the word was with God and the word was God. If something already existed, it can't have a beginning. In the beginning, the word already existed. So at the very beginning of everything, the word already existed. And then when God begets Jesus, he sends Jesus into human flesh, right? Now, once again, this is the significance of understanding the creation and the, the relationship between God the Father and the only begotten as revealed to Moses and also as expressed in the book of Abraham. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting here are some of the nuances of this verse. And because, you know, this verse is the original text is in Greek, it's not in Hebrew. So it's not like the creation where we can go to the original, original text in Hebrew. This text, uh, this, the earliest we have is in the Greek. The What we are going to do is we're going to do a quick review on some of the nuances in the terms. And this is John 1, verses 1. What we're going to do is we're just going to kind of discuss here how the term God is used even within verse 1. So as we go back here and we just... Let's relook at this real quick before we go to chat GBT. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. So here, Ruslan is taking the interpretation that the word, which is Jesus, is also God, right? And that when it says, you know, the word was with God, and the word was God, he's just saying that's just different ways of expressing the same thing that Jesus always existed and that that, that was that there's no hierarchy there. Now, when we go to the Greek nuances here, it says here, the first occurrence of God in this verse is in the phrase, the word was with God. Here, Theon is in the accusative case indicating the object of the preposition, prose or with, this usage suggests a relational aspect between the word and God. So right off the bat, there's two things to notice here. The term God here uses theon, right? And, 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 and then there is a relationship type expressing word. So it, it seems to be that that first statement when it's mentioning God in the word, that it's trying to express a relationship between the, between the God and the word. The second occurrence is in God was the word. Here, theos is in nominative case indicating the subject of the clause. The usage emphasizes the divine nature and quality of the word of the word. So the first Things to, to notice here is the God that's used at the top, not only is it relational to the word because it has the term with, but the word is theon. Then the next God is theos, and we're going to dive into that a little bit more. But basically, the theos term use of God was the word, it seems to be kind of geared towards expressing the nature of the word. So just like Nabil was saying, hey, one in being, you're a human being, I'm a human being. This verse in verse one is focusing on there's a relationship between the word and theon, and then it goes theos for God, but it's it's focusing on that it's the nature. It's trying to express the nature of the word. So it's saying the word is a being, God the Father is a being. And there's a relationship between them. We would say in the LDS church, yeah, father and a son. Then the next part is expressing, well, the son has qualities very similar to the father, meaning the, the nature, like we're just like human beings, human beings, God and a God inherited as, you know, father and son. So what we're going to do now is we're going to dive down and we're going to focus on so what I asked chat GPT is, okay, great. You kind of give me a description summary of the usage of God. And I, and I recognize that there's a theos and a theon. Then I asked chat GPT, is there a significance of the use of the article in the Greek script in using the term God? So basically what I was getting to is, are, are there any hints in, in the use of articles? Because it started to say with 
was a significant thing to understand when the, the Greek term that's translated as with is used on the very first line of John 1. It's trying to express a relationship. Well, I said, well, are there any nuances in, in articles in trying to express any differences in the term God? You know, and this is what we get back. So in verse 1, the phrase, the word was with the God, you notice here it adds the word the, uses the definite article before theon. This points to a specific entity often understood to refer to God the Father, emphasizing the word's relationship with the Father. So once again, it doesn't just say with God. It says in the Greek with the God. God, meaning this is a, when you add the word the God, like the goat, like it is, it is narrowing into a very specific individual or, or being that is, seems to be, want to be highlighted as separate. And then when we go to the second portion, it says, in contrast, God was the word lacks the definite article before theos so not only is there a different uses of the term theon and theos but in theon it has a definite article the separating highlighting it making it unique and different from the word but that definite article is missing when it says and the word was god which once again it's it's it's, it's coming back to abinadi's distinction abinadi says Jesus is the Father because he created all things, right? But he doesn't get the God. He is a God, authorized by the God. But he's also the Son because he takes on the flesh. So when, so once I once I completed that and I had Jet GPT do all um all five verses. Um, and then here in verse two, it does the same thing with the the. Similar to the first verse, with the God uses the definite article, emphasizing the specificity of the reference to God the Father. So in verse 1 and verse 2, there are terms where God doesn't have the definite article, and God, when it does have the definite article, and it's trying to, to separate them, as in the God, God the Father, and God that is the Word. So once that once that was done, I then said, because I noticed the differences between the word Theon and Theos, so I asked JetGPT, why does the Greek use Theon versus Theos? Then it says here, the distinction between Theon and Theos in the Greek is significant in understanding the theological nuances in passages like John 1 verses 1 through 5. Here is the breakdown. Theon. In Greek, Theon is in the accusative case. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it appears as proton theon, which translates as to with God. When preceded by the preposition with, the accusative case indicates the direct object of the preposition. The usage emphasizes the relational aspect, highlighting the, relation, the word's relationship with God. Theon with the definite article ton, the, is typically used to reference God in a specific personal sense, often understood to denote God the Father and emphasize a specific entity within the Godhead. Once again, Theon is tied to a definite article, which really is the Greek is trying to separate him as a supreme, as the ultimate God. This is why Jesus, when he resurrected and shows himself to Mary, he says, I'm going to your God, who is my God. I'm going to your father, who is my father. And then in Theos, in John 1, Theos appears without the definite article. So really, the term God are used, but the Theon is specifically assigned to God, the father in Theos. But in the English, it, it comes across as being used as exactly the same, which is not, not the case in Greek. We'll come back here to our brother, Ruslan. And check this out. Check out Revelation. Here you have Revelation chapter 1. And this is, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. How can Jesus 
ever have a beginning? How can Jesus ever exist without the Father? Or, or excuse me, how can the Father ever exist without Jesus? If here it's very clearly being said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Okay, I am the one who is, who always was. Oh, you know, always means it means always. You know, what beginning means it means beginning, and who is still to come. And then here, this is the profession, the Almighty One, the profession that He is the Almighty God, right? And again, we see it again in uh, Revelation. This is now Revelation chapter twenty-two. This is the end of the book. Again, repeat it again. Jesus, Jesus, speaking, repeating it again. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Something cannot have a beginning. If it is the beginning, Jesus does not have a beginning. Why? Because he is the beginning. He is eternal with God. Okay. And so I think this, this conversation is a lot simpler than people would. The, the LDS position on that is this earth is not the first of God's creations, right? There's, there's, there's eons and endless eternities, endless eternities before this earth. And it is expressed in the book of Moses where he's saying in the beginning, and, and God is not speaking about the beginning of all things. What he's referencing is the beginning of a work. And, and, it's, and it's directly related to this creation, the beginning of this creation. This is not the only earth. This is not the only creation. God has works that predate this work, and he'll have work after this and so that's 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 the nuance that the lds would take into this is this is referencing to the beginning of this creation's work and it is by no means an expression of the beginning of god the father or of jesus because we do understand that jesus predates this creation just as the father predates this creation however it is very clear that jesus does not predate the father because why? The Father is who authorizes Jesus and gives Jesus the capacity to be who he is. Remove the Father, there is no Jesus. That's something that's really important. I would like to acknowledge, but we are often chasing different doctrines and, mm -hmm. and wrestling with these things. And so I wanted just to kind of point back to that because I think the Trinity is, is, is important and it has implications. That's the crazy part is the Trinity has implications for our day-to-day -day life. You will have so much liberation in understanding how to function in a healthy manner within your marriage, within there being distinctive roles within your marriage, yet there being equality within your marriage, if you understand the Trinity. I agree 100%. This is why not only an understanding of the Trinity is critical, because it gives you insight into the nature of God, um, and really you have to go back to the beginning to have a proper understanding of that. The distinction of God the Father and the Savior is critical to, to understand from the beginning because why, Once the, the, like I mentioned earlier, there is a transition from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2 in Elohim alone. Then the seventh day comes about at the end of the creation of Genesis 1, and there's a transition of power, it appears, or not necessarily power, but in, in moving the work forward to Elohim Jehovah, and that's where Jehovah is first mentioned. And we all know that Jehovah is Jesus in the LDS doctrine. So there is a transition there. And not being able to understand that transition leads to the confusion of when Jehovah as God the Father, when, when, when there's that nuance in the creation efforts that goes on. And then also really the the ability to distinguish the roles of God the Father and, and Jesus leads to the challenges of, of distinguishing them and really mashing them up into one. Really, what, what it really boils down from my perspective is, is the Trinitarian definition is, is, is defining Jesus and the different roles that Jesus takes. If you take the Trinity and you place it on the Savior, and his role as Jehovah, and his role as the creator, and his role as the savior, the Trinity seems to fit very well in describing the role of Jesus Christ. Because why? He is Jehovah, as expressed in the Old Testament. He is also the creator 
of the earth. And we go into the details. There is what, what we call the create the godly creative pattern. And that's really focusing on three terms, make, create, and formed. Jesus is the creator and the former. God is the maker. And we get into those details in the creation account. And so when you take the Trinitarian position and you apply it to Jesus's roles alone, it seems to fit very well, right? Because Jesus is the father, the creator of all spiritual things. He also comes down and he's the one who executes the atonement. He's also raised up. He is the, the alpha and the omega in regards to this creation. He is also the author, the author and the finisher of our faith because it is only through him and by him that we're able to return to the Father. But the reason why that's insufficient is because we follow the Savior because the Savior leads us to God the Father. And so that is life eternal, is to understand God the Father. And God has authorized Jesus to act as the Father for us in all intents and purposes, especially through the atonement to come back to him. And so... Really, that that is a a critical part of our religion and our faith is to properly understand who God the Father is in His Son Jesus Christ and the role of the Holy Ghost. So, really, from the LDS perspective and through the creation and the scriptures as expressed through the Bible, um, the Book of Mormon, and also through the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. God the Father, and we'll end with this scripture. And this is where I really agree with Nabil. The significance of revelation to understand the nature of God is absolutely critical. This is why God has restored his church and has given more scriptures and has given prophets to guide and lead us in these latter days. Because without revelation, we have no ability to navigate this, this significant doctrine. And so in Doctrine and Covenants 130, it specifically states in verse 22, the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man, the Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit, were it not so, the Holy Ghost could not dwell in us. So the LDS position on the God is, is God the Father is a separate being, an individual who has a body of his own, Jesus is a separate individual in being who has a body of his own since he manifested in the flesh and resurrected. Before he did so, he was a spiritual being as well that was co-eternal with God and was and is the creator of this world and this earth. And that the Holy Ghost is a personage of spirit, separate and independent of God the Father and of Jesus who is testifying to us of the truthfulness of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So, once again, really recommend everyone to really spend the time, develop the proper knowledge, spend the time and energy to develop uh, the knowledge and the understanding and the revelation of the nature of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Ghost, and invite you all to join in on our creation series as we go through the details on how this distinction between God the Father really is expressed in the creation account and also so many other details that the doctrine and proper understanding of the creation flows down and impacts our ability to understand the entire plan of salvation and the whole purpose of life. With that being said, we appreciate everybody joining us today. Have a good one. Feel free to share this with anyone that you think would add value to them. Like and subscribe uh, to the channel to keep us moving forward. And have a great day. And thank you for everyone's time.